layer, and, and believe me, as, as a first target, you don't want to look at the data path acceleration hardware layer no. uh, for the X5000. It's far too complex. What's simple and everywhere is real tech, like an RTL8139. Okay. So I was going to do an implementation to that chip and then distribute that one with the, with the template as, as an example. That'd be awesome. So I think that solves the problem because we have, you know, Hyperion, yes, they, they, the driver I'm writing or I've written and what I'll improve, they're getting and it is going into the OS, you know, but I still retain ownership of it. Okay. That's why I asked. They, they get a fork. But yeah. You know. But yes, for distribution purposes, to keep everybody from going, oh, that's my switch. Fair enough. Yeah, no, I just, uh, uh, I think a, a separate implementation though to a generic. Plus, it'll, it will apply to a much wider base of, of Amiga machines. Yeah. Because, you know, you've got a PCI or a PCIe card, real tech chip on it that you can put into whatever you single want. Uh, yeah. 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 Except for the table. Except for the what? Except for the 22. No table. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Well, that has no expansion. Right. He's calling it by its original code name. And it, and it doesn't actually need it. Either, so. No. Because it has it. You don't call it a table. A12. Yes. Or the A123. <laughs> code names. Code names. The meeting list. Well, it's not released as an actual one. Once, it, once it's available to the public as an Amigo uh, 1 A1222, yeah. then it's an Amigo 1 <laughs> By me. Where's Trevor? Well, this is probably a very basic question, but for the yeah. hardware layer code, how are you developing that? Is that like some base code from like Realtek or I mean, how, how do you do how do you, how do you, how do you do the, the hardware layer? Yeah, the hardware layer. Yeah, how do you develop that? The hardware layer ends up being I, I have a uh, I have a starting simple API in the top. In fact, I can show that to you. Is what I would do in creating a new uh, template is under the hardware here, I've got uh, 12 century two. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's for the P1022 chip. And then I also have for the X5000 stuff. But I have this one right here called the SATA2 template. These headers and corresponding code uh, right here config interface, read MAC address, set MAC station address, tune the FI, verify the machine type, and write the MAC address. This is what I have so far as things that are common, right? So what I do is I copy that uh, Santa 2 template directory, rename it to whatever the actual target is, and then fill in those functions. And those functions are called from the top layers for do the main initialization. But when it gets really these are pretty straightforward. Tune Phi is actually should look, the corresponding code for that should set up the actual Phi hardware. So you've got the Mac chip uh, itself communicating with the Phi, which is your physical uh, port, right? And it, you, it, it's got logic to it. It's 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 not just a plug. There there's a corresponding chip uh, to it, and you do communication back between the Mac and the Phi. So so this is the Two and Phi is is getting really low level and reaching right into that endpoint of the Phi chip and saying, set yourself up the following way, and that's where you would do stuff like auto negotiation, actually set it into where it attempts to lock to the to the signal um, frequency and find out what it can communicate the fastest it can communicate, <laughs> and hopefully it, in this case we're if you always hope for you know gigabit speed full duplex is what you're hoping to lock to. I mean, I mean, do you have, like, do you have um, when you're building this from, from the manufacturer or vendor, you have some... some oh, the, uh, uh, the technical like, reference, like, reference documentation? Yeah, reference, like, or like some reference code sure. and taking that. Well, reference code, good or, luck. No, um, good luck. Okay. Reference documentation, yeah, okay. uh, it can, it's, it's a lot. Uh -huh. uh, there's a lot to potentially pour through. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, again, it's, it's vendor specific. Yeah. How open are they with their chip? Right. Um, what you need to do for this type of stuff is you nail down what, what was actually used. Uh, like with the, the five chips and these machines, you can look right at them, you know, at the actual device. It's like, okay, like, so this, uh, on the X5000, the bottom port by itself is one type, so it's like a, a, a KS, I don't know, I got it there. 
Uh, there's there's one, the one type of chip for it, and also the corresponding magnets, which is allow, allows it to be 10, 100, or 1,000 speed. Uh, the, the other port, which is connected to, st stacked with the two USB ports, is a magic jack. It's a magic jack interface. And that hardware is actually rated at 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. So that that phi could handle up to 10 gigabit speed, uh, assuming it was connected to the corresponding Mac and all the, the data channels for the side. It'd be nice if the, the 10, 10, 10 gigabit Mac of the X5000 chip, which is in there, was actually wired to that at 10 gigabit. So identify the chip uh, from the phi on back, and then you know it's it's all the reference documentation from there. You know, so it really gets down into the the, the nitty gritty uh, in, in setting it up. Um, but again, there are some common things from a template standpoint. These are the entry point APIs where it's like so. So hopefully, there's 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 no other calls into the hardware layer except these from the top. And everything else happens in there, but you have some pretty big ones like config interface. That could be just about anything, whatever the hardware needs to be set up. But when you get down into the individual uh, parts uh, on these chips, um, you're identifying the registers. Where is the hardware uh, accessible from? How do the registers need to be set up? And then you're usually setting them with actually an assembly language routine. I do everything with inline assembly macros at that point. So you're so you're making those so you're guaranteed to be making those sets the right way uh, to the to the hardware. Uh, and and nothing else is going on. Is it and it really gets so the hardware is very specific. You have to set this and this and right, this right. exactly that way. Otherwise it doesn't set it up. But essentially with the Mac most of the Mac chips you should see a lot of commonality between them. Um, and the FIs as well. So on a given implementation for Ethernet, those two, those, those two chips should have a lot in common with others. So if you had a pretty good implementation, you could look at something like an RTL 8169, for example, how that was handled. And if you look at the initialization of the MAC on that and how the MAC address is set, and you look at the initialization of the PHY for your specific one, that might be, that might be correct. But there's different ways to communicate with the PHY as well. Uh, this one is wired as uh, RGMIR, so it's reduced gigabit um, uh, multimedia, not the thing, it's uh, uh, management, media management interface, I believe. I always miss on that. But anyway, it's a, originally to the PHY, you got uh, all eight wires, and they would use all of them, but then they figured out, well, if we can go twice as fast with clock speed and alternate back and forth, and use half the pins. So, same speed, half the pins, cheaper to make. And so you had your, you know, uh, your gigabit speed using all the wires, and then you have your reduced gigabit speed uh, using half the wires, but the same speed. And that's that's the way it's wired. But the, the Phi itself could, the chip that, that, that's in there, you could handle like, like three, four different modes: so S, STMI, RGMII, and then the lower ones too for 10, 10, uh, 10 megabit and 100 megabit speeds. They don't need, they don't use the same program because. They don't use many wires. But, so you have to have all of that aligned. So that you have to identify the MAC chip, identify the PHY chip, identify how it was wired, and then set up communication of the, the MAC to match that communication method to the PHY, and then you set it all up. So if you're digging into new Ethernet driver hardware for new implementation, it's really down to the documentation of vendors. And, and, and I hope somebody provided an example. You, you can look to Linux for drivers, but the biggest issue is if you don't understand all the rest of this stuff on how you talk to Amico OS, the Linux driver is only going to baffle you because it takes a lot to drill down into the Linux driver to say, that's where it's actually tweaking the hardware. This is the bit I need to know. All of this is the rest of the way devices are handled in Linux, which is the same kind of thing here. So if you end up bringing a lot. I tried several different approaches looking at BSD and Linux for driver examples, but you just you just end up bringing way too much of Linux into the equation, yeah. and it's not the big way to do it. But all I really wanted to know was how do I set up the hardware? Uh, and of course, there's a lot of different, a lot of different ones. 
the Ethernet that's in the uh, uh, the A1222 isn't even a standard one. Uh, where you can see like a, a three-speed Ethernet controller, it's actually an enhanced. So it has additional features uh, with its, uh, so it's an E. Uh, T S C E C E E T C, um, which again is different. You know, it has its own hardware offering. Some have, uh, well, I would say probably most have PMA to move stuff in and out of an internal ring buffer. Some don't. So sometimes you have to do all that ring buffer stuff yourself. So depends on the chip. But that's device driver programming for you. I mean, it's it, that's that's why it's that's that's why not it's, you know small audience of people do this because <laughs> it's just you, you got to be willing to bang the metal, get right down, and find out how the hardware works and, and how to set it up, and, and then figure out how to make that communicate up to them. Don't, don't forget everybody wants it. That's right. Yeah, because devices should come. All all device drivers should come with the OS. I mean, they're free, aren't they? Yeah, it can't be hard. Yeah, it can't be difficult. So what's the problem? <laughs> 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 Should come with the hardware. Yeah. You're in the forums all the time. Yes. How hard could it be to do it? How long do you have? <laughs> Just quickly, if yes. someone did want to get started writing a, a driver with your template, are there sort of places that say insert code here? Um, <laughs> yes, 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 there are. Yes, I did. I did put in some of those uh, already, and I, I do plan on documenting this structure further. Uh, I would have gone through like a probably a whole PDF documenting this stuff from a top level if I had time to write one. Uh, but since I did, this is mostly off the cuff. So, so how much are the printed books going to cost? Well, now there I can monetize. Wouldn't be much, I tell you. Got to get that information out there. But a printed book, honestly, probably not much more than it costs to print. The, so, uh, a PDF for free. <laughs> so when you get ABD done, you don't have a wizard button that just fills in all those blanks for you. <laughs> yeah, you'll be able to select it. Literally, be able to select it as a, as a device driver template. Hey, I want to write a device driver. Start with this template. Oh no, I mean fill in the template. Oh, it fill in all the gaps. Yeah, <laughs> it'll, it'll read the manuals for you too. <laughs> well, there you go. The, the code all JV and you insert money in. That's, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> There's nothing that comes out of ABD that I don't figure out how to write first. I gotta write it. Someone. Yeah, somebody has to write it. And then put it together into a system that hopefully hopefully lets you build building blocks. <laughs> so the, the unique thing you've done is you've actually uh, offered to release the code to the public. Yeah. Shocking. <laughs> Because <laughs> I don't know how many people have done this over and over and over. Yeah, Plus, and with varying levels of success. Like, uh, all the way back to the 80s. Yeah. 90s. yeah. Some of the some of those device driver what they're quoting is terrible. Everybody keeps it secret. Because it was terrible. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Well, <laughs> as you know, I mean there's when, when you get down to the hardware layer and you start talking about interrupts. For example, I mean this. This is kind of information that's very, very difficult because it's not updated. I mean that, that's the problem we have. It, has to be, it needs to be documented, you know, updated. You need to know how to do it. Like so, it's like if you you need to obtain an interrupt line because God forbid you would want in your main loop to do a pulling where it constantly looked at the hardware to see if there was any data there. No, 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 no. no. There are plenty of hardware interrupt lines in the hardware that when the data arrives at the hardware, it can signal an interrupt. But how do you capture that interrupt under the OS? That is the undocumented mystery. And I can tell you, it's actually pretty straightforward. Just if you, can, you, you allocate it just the same way you would back from was the original design when Carlos Sathenrath put it down and said, yeah, this is the way it work. I even referenced his book, <laughs> How Interrupts Work. And it, it's terrific, but the magic is the values, because the original interrupt lines that are documented, when you say I want to allocate a single bit for an interrupt, you only have the original classic hardware. It's the interrupt lines for the blitter and Agnes, you know, it's all that, right? And that's it. And so why didn't Carl uh, put the interrupt lines for the future hardware? It's easy. I don't know. Not enough foresight. 
Because <laughs> you couldn't see 20 years into the yeah, future and write that for us? Eventually they're going to have more. I don't understand. So, <laughs> in, in this particular case, the way you solve that, that problem is you, have, you look at the documentation for the chip. It'll lay out all of the interrupt lines, which ones they, they are for all the hardware. You find the one for, this is transmit interrupt for the Ethernet hardware. This is receive interrupt. And then you go back to the OS call, and you take <laughs> that number from the book, and you add 16 to it, and then you add 16 more to it. In other words, you add 32 to it. Yeah. 16 to skip the first 16 interrupt lines from the classic, 16 more for a mysterious reason, I have no idea. And then you can use the number in the book. So if it says interrupt line 52, I think it's the same. Um, Three, four. And, the, and, uh, and oh, you oh, add. I have to turn the camera on. <laughs> oh, the secret. You, know, you look at the, look at the reference manual. It's in the Power PC interrupt line just says it's, it's 52 on there. You add 32 to it, and then you ask the OS for it. And the answer is 42. And the answer is 42, which is you know, life universe and everything. So. Oh, is that what the interrupt is? No. Oh, that cool. It would be. <laughs> one of them is. One of them is. Do you, yeah. you know how I found one of the interrupt lines before? Was uh, I didn't know what to do either. I got the yeah. U-boot source code and looked in there. <laughs> yes. And then I found, hey, look, it's offset by blah, whatever that magic number was. Whatever the magic number But that took, I don't know, days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it should be in a header file. The, the header file is terrific. I, I love the header file because it lists the classic interrupt lines, and then it finishes by saying, and there may be more. Okay. Right. There could be more. That's, oh, that's probably where the extra 16 comes from. It is. It's a new What's one. that? That the extra 16 you have to add could be, and there could be more. And there could be more. Yeah. Right. Which is 16. Okay. They decided. So, yeah. Can we, can you tell us? I, I don't know who did it. Uh, to, to add the offset to then start looking at the actual article. Oh, uh, that was uh, Thomas and Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. And, and, and it's a funny idea. You, you have to skip the old ones. Yeah, it means that. You, know, you, you just have to document But the problem is we have no header file to tell anybody else. Yeah. So that's, that, is one of, that is one of the problems. Um, yeah. And it's critical because if you're try debugging an interrupt line, when you don't know which one it is, right? Is you, you, you go, all oh, right, well, I know that there's 16, so maybe it's 17 or 18 or whatever. Yeah, so you, you start looking at that, and now you get intermittent results because that's the right. you, you, you find one that you know. Yeah. And you try to work backwards. You try to work backwards. Yeah. 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 Just give us the number. Yeah. But you have to know that one. So, you know, so, 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 yeah. so the magic is, just <laughs> the magic is add 32. Yeah, that, that, was, that was a good. So, but without it, again, it's another brick wall. And I ran into, um, I don't know, half a dozen of them trying to develop a driver, much less an Ethernet driver. And until you can actually track down and talk to somebody person to person who knows, there's no way to find out. And that's, that's a fundamental problem we need to there's solve. There's absolutely no documentation, even from uh, viruses? No, God, no, especially not from viruses. No. There's nothing. No. So you're going to give us your hot client. <laughs> yes, yeah, if you're willing to wait through the U-Boot, which I did. Yeah. Um, and you again, Linux it's right. Linux. I mean, U-Boot is, U -boot is the, the Linux driver system simplified. And it's only simplified in the fact that it's one layer. Instead of having your supervisor and your user space Kernel space and user space separation, they just flattened it to say everything is user space. But it's still just the same as, as Linux, which is, there's nothing necessarily wrong, technically, with the Linux device system. It's very open in terms of like wow. adapting it to the hardware. Okay, there's problems. You gotta know two systems. You have to know two systems, that's exactly right. You have to totally understand what, how Linux does it, why does it that way, yeah. and then you have to understand why, how Amigo OS does it. Yeah, I'm talking. Yeah. When really the bottom line is you just needed to know how Amigo OS did it and then figure out the hardware code. Yeah. yeah. Which is what this is for. So, 
So it's a start. So any other questions? We've got one more. Just curious about the hardware. How informative is the hardware about why things are going wrong? Because with graphics driver development, the, one of the biggest problems is your feedback is it hangs. Yes. Right? Yes. And you don't get much information as to what hung right. or why. No, no, you're, you're in the exact same boat. Exactly. So same, same thing with Ethernet. There's, you know, you, you, hope, you hope that the serial output gives you what's going on. Um, you could you could try to examine the, uh, the raw uh, memory locations and see what's been changed. Uh, if you can get to it when it goes bad, because most times you can. I mean, what I wouldn't give for a, a hardware debugger, actually from an external machine with full I/O lines into it, just slave that the whole the whole machine would just be a test bed. You know, it froze and you went, you know, where's our uh, uh, where's our little, you know the, the quick snapshot cartridge on the the Nvidia 500 that just froze everything and then you rip all the music. In. We need that. That's a, you know. And there's, but there's supporting hardware in there. I mean, that's the only thing that gives me some promise is the, in the X5000 in particular. There's a, a debugged uh, supervisor, debugged memory management unit. You could set it up to single step the entire processor. You know, just stop every single instruction on a given core. Just stop, interrupt, and come back. So I mean, the hardware is there at least in part, to give us some kind of debugging system outside of the OS, clearly outside of the OS. And we even have additional processing cores that we're not using. Right. So your OS is running on core 0, your debugger could be running on core 1 in correspondence with the debugging MMU, and you'd have something real. But the most we can hope for right now is, is just debug messages. I have had limited success with um, uh, DB101, uh, which I'm, uh, I, I'm in contact with the author on that, and I'll be including support for that in ABD as well, uh, because it's the only graphical interface debugging system that runs natively on the OS 4 and anything close to state. The, uh, and it's very difficult, of course, as you know, you, when you're, you're, you can corrupt memory so easily. Uh, it is very difficult to be able to successfully run an application on the OS monitoring an application, especially a device front, on the OS in an encapsulated so that when it dies, the rest of it doesn't die with it. Yeah. So that's your biggest problem. You're just stuck, right? There's no, there's no, there's no output. So with this, it was mostly just debug output, uh, serial, and hoping to capture enough of it to find out why it was failing. And, you know, uh, I did have reasonable success with that, I think in part because kicks off some process, but it slows it down a lot. Yes. Yes, you know, uh, that's, which is, which is again a problem, especially if you're trying to debug a race condition. And you're deep, you use a debug output, you give it tons of debug output, and it slows it down enough, the race condition never happens. And you never know where it went. You take all the debug statements out and runs it full speed. <laughs> <time. laughs> Very annoying. But, uh, but yeah, so I mean, I, I didn't have any other uh, methods I was able to take and use. But like I said, uh, a DB101, which there's a version of available on uh, OS4 Depot, it's free. Um, it is a actual, uh, you know, visual debugger. It's not, it, it's not so the GCC. It's open source, too. Yeah, it's open source. Yeah. It's on GitHub. Yeah. But he's making a brand new version. Oh. Yeah. He didn't know. Simple. Uh, visual interface does not need, does not equal easy. 
uh, especially if all you did is create visual gadgets over the same complex system. It does not necessarily make it easier to understand. But in this case, it does simplify some of the things. So it allows you to uh, either load in, it'll try to live capture a running program. And it also lets you load a program to launch it under the debugger. And then you can give it the base of your source code and it'll match up the, the lines for it. And then you can set breakpoints, and when it crashes, you hopefully see exactly where uh, in your source and stuff like that. So it's much easier to browse. <laughs> yeah. Our drivers, yeah. All you get is a crash. Yeah, right. Power it off. Power it back on. So you need to take separate. Take another guess, check it off. Yeah. Oh yeah, I have done that far too often. <laughs> uh, even, even the visual debugger you can't use because if the graphics driver crashes. Yeah. 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 You, you need you to need an entirely parallel uh, video subsystem that's isolated yeah. for us. So you need a separate driver. Yeah. A separate video. Yeah. yeah. To, to mirror what you see. That can't crash. Well, all you got is this really <laughs> game and you can flicker. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's what I do at work. I get an LED. LED. I get one or two if I'm lucky. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. It's not much to go by. It's it's enough. Especially when you're rusty on the horse. <laughs> How much can you do with these two LEDs? It's amazing what you can do with two LEDs. You can do with four states. I used to work for a, a, a UPS company made unadroken power supplies, and they they have a, a video, uh, an audio beep on the unit, oh. and they programmed it to beep Morse, so that the no. yeah, so the actual uh, service text that guys come out and say, my my unit's not working, it's beeping at me, it's a full phone next to it. Oh, you got to need a new uh, fan. Is that true? <laughs> it was a, it's an, amazing, it's an amazing little piece of engineering. It was so simple, it was so effective. All they had to do was hear it. Yeah, send out the right part. That's brilliant. Yeah. Because they were made to be maintained. They weren't like throwing around. They were parts. Yeah. Real. Okay. You want to jump into your SATA stuff? Any other questions? Yeah, any other any other questions in general or at all? Yeah, that's that's basically the main thing. When can we get it? Yeah. Oh, you, I um, think they want to ride a driver. Yeah, I yeah. like this. You got any, you got any <laughs> ideas? Get some hardware we want to bring. Oh, the boots. Oh, the boots. Oh, slow down there. Oh, if I if I get my machine back, well, yeah. over here, I gotta hack some code. Maybe I'll have something more to show tomorrow. Actually, there's a lot of devices that would be fun to, to play with to add to the 5000. I'm not sure whether the external drivers, like for example, a webcam. Yeah. No, I, I can definitely, I can list a few. In fact, I, I would ask this guy about them because it's, it's right in the row. Oh. Yeah. So, but I'll get to that. So, do you need this machine? Yeah, just, just to show my PDF. Hey, I have oh, a question. I have a question. <laughs> show PDF. Your, the documentation, um, like the power PC interrupts, for example, yeah. you're going to have uh, a bunch of documentation in ABD, correct? Oh, you yeah. can't cover the gamut, of course. But yeah, no, eventually, I mean, I'll, I'll try to document the source code as much as possible, but then I'll probably end up writing blog articles about tricky bits and eventually a full manual and, right. and, and maybe a series of books because, you know, it's there, there's so much not out there anymore. Right, and that is program. really important to get information in people's hands. So yeah, I'd love, I'd love to do it. I, it's, it's always been a plan for about 20 years to eventually you, start writing books. You can do it like the original Kickstarter books, or the Kickstarter articles, where we added it, we added it. Yeah, re, uh, rev, uh, rev 4, stretch the Kickstarter around it. No, no, there was a, a, a magazine that was called Kickstarter. And old, they old Kickstarter, not the Kickstarter. They made three books where they had all the different coding examples. Yeah. Remember that? Ah, that's no, I don't think I have any of those. I had the, uh, what was it, the, the, uh, the tech journal. 
to detect your illness. Those, those are rare and precious. Right. And of course, the, the, the Amiga ROM kernel reference manuals are bad. They're well, still the, the tone. What form did Amiga mail take? Was it electronic? It was paper. It was paper? Yeah. They're all on the wiki. Yeah, I know. I, I helped. Uh, Oh, yeah, you done. Yeah, but that was all some crumb paper. They thought that would be the same with But I figured that what we need now, I mean, the best way to document how to do something is to actually provide it in code and example with as much supporting discussion as possible. But if you can't see how it actually is done in code, you know, you can talk all day about concept but in theory, but it's not going to tell you how to actually do it. You need both. Yeah. You need both. And since we have very limited time, we have to start with what works and document back. Yes. There. That's the best. Yeah. Something that works. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. The easiest learning tool is, in fact, something that's readable with example. Yes. That and works. And it just, <laughs> that it just works. And unfortunately, you know, you're basically having really the problem we used to run into when people would program, then they come demo it, they, they do it so well, they go back to the, uh, to the group and they were saying, yeah, you can do this, you can do this, and oh yeah, you can do this, and there would be no demo because the person was talking to themselves. <laughs> right. So yeah. you, really, what you really needed was somebody who knew the program, somebody who could speak and say, listen to this, or something you could read. You can't read, you know, that's why, that's why your wiki's good, but it, there's so much more. Oh yeah. Yes. Need more. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It's only half the problem. Yeah. And you really have to document. Because you come back after 10 years or so, and you go, what did I do? You know, you got to, you have to die. I document all the time. Sometimes I change, I change the person on there, too. Sometimes I'm talking to myself. Sometimes I'm writing as if somebody else is reading it. It's kind of, it kind of goes back and forth. When it is. I usually am trying to write it in the context of somebody else's reading this. You know, and maybe convey my thoughts, even though I, I know some cases it's only going to be me that ever looks at it again. It's also yeah. <laughs> and especially when you don't no. finish something, because that's really hard. Yeah, you have a very big complex uh, project, and you're wrong talking about everything. <laughs> yeah, I'm still not talking. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, went back to it this weekend. We have to flash it to the machine. <laughs> when you're designing it, it's like, it doesn't use yeah, it. it's all coming, it's like, child, child can do this. So, 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 so simple. So <laughs> simple. And then you look at it later and go, what the? Where was I going? I didn't finish it, so I don't know where I was going. And I don't know why I was looking at the sign. Man, I should have thought about this. So, you rewritten the sign, we had to go back in and found out, oh crap, I already wrote this. this. I agonized for years over stuff that I knew I so, needed so, 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 so what it did is it, to get it, back to it, I kind of write this one, I write this one, right? I finally got yeah. back to it. I don't know. Can I? I did that. Get it. So I was like, <laughs> I was doing this whole thing and work my back way back down to the same spot. I just need to flash the. I'm going to go through a little uh, bit of my SATA driver here. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. So I apologize for the diagrams, they're kind of primitive, but uh, I was in a hurry. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're lucky. I didn't have time to do that. Oh, I did better than you. But yeah, it's good. As long as you show this in the, in the code. Oh, oh, well, unfortunately, the code I can't access at the moment, so I'm going to kind of. Oh, it's on the drive there. Yeah. yeah. And, but, uh, um, the important thing is that you just talked about units. Yes. And tasks and processes and the stuff of that, right? So I'm going to tell you everything you did is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> if you're writing a standard driver. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> slap back. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good provisor right there. It's not all wrong. No, it's not all wrong. But see, in Amiga, like Jamie was saying, you have a device and a unit, right? And a device would be, uh, in this case, the P1022 SATA device. That's what I'm talking about. So I'm writing a SATA driver, right? And my unit, in this case, is a physical SATA port. And on the 1022, there are two SATA ports. The 0 and 1, I believe, they're labeled on the board. Yeah, 0 and 1. 0 and 1. Yeah. It's been a while. <laughs> and so, my, uh, the, the, so this represents, um, let's call it a, a software entity, right? So I have a SATA device. Uh, unit, a driver, every unit equals a physical part, right? 
But I also have something called a V-SATA device, which has a unit that equals media. So each unit in my virtual SATA device is a media, which would be a CD or a disk. Because in the world of SATA, you can plug in and unplug devices at any time. And you can add devices and remove devices at any time. E-SATA. Yes, E-SATA. That's one example. Yeah, that's one example. So, we've had, we being uh, uh, Sebastian Bowers, the person I've been coordinating with, uh, have come up with a scheme where we introduce a new layer called the virtual SATA layer in between the driver that Jamie just talked about and the rest of the system to handle this media unit. Because, uh, say for example, you have uh, a USB stick, you can plug it in your Amiga, right? What does it show you on Workbench? A disk. Right? It shows you a disk, right? That's a media. That's got nothing to do with the SATA port. <laughs> nothing to do with any physical port, say for example. Uh, you can plug it into your eSATA port. That media says, uh, you know, CD-ROM 1 or whatever, or disk 1, I should say. Unplug it, plug in another one, it says disk 2. Well, disk 1 stays around in Amiga land. Disk 2 stays around in Amiga land. But there's only one physical port. <laughs> this is an old feature from uh, the good old floppy days. Remember, you could kickstart and then workbench and then kickstart and workbench back and forth, right? No other OS does this. <laughs> There's a good reason. <laughs> this is a pain in the. Anyway, <laughs> so we're trying to continue to support that in a SATA and USB uh, environment. USB has the same issue. Exact same problem. So if you want to do a USB device, you're back to tier two again. Um, there's also another problem with SATA devices in that uh, they talk to file systems. <laughs> like my my client is a file system. Your client was Brochure. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, almost always. Yeah. Well, I have NGFS to talk to. Right. Not the most exciting <laughs> customer. Um, <laughs> very aggressive. <laughs> I guess Roadshow is pretty aggressive too. Uh, it is. Yeah, it's like all of a sudden burst and then nothing. Reset, reset, burst, burst, reset. You're like, whoa, dude! <laughs> That's the kind of messages you're receiving from your client, right? That's how I look at it. Now, monitor library is inserted in the middle because he's the guy who I have to talk to every time that somebody inserts new media. So if you insert, say, a new disk into, say, a port one, I have to go, say, monitor library. When somebody inserted something into port one, go scan it. In monitor library, it becomes my customer for a while. And he goes and he starts scanning it, and he goes, oh, I found three different partitions on there. Bing, bing, bing. Right? <laughs> now I got to map those three partitions to one single physical port. <laughs> ah, I'm getting confused, right? So um, then it hands control over to the file system to actually parse the data, as I call it. Right? So after it knows, okay, this partition's NGFS, this must be the file system. So that's SFS. That's three different customers, so one physical porting. So I got this whole complexity issue, kind of like the Sonos uh, solves. Your Sonos 2? That's what solves that problem. Well, there's no such layer in uh, these, these practice devices. No one's ever came up with it. So that, that's why we're talking about the virtual SATA. I don't have a better name for it yet. So we're kind of calling it the B SATA device. <laughs> They might think it's a better name. <laughs> so this is what, uh, in, in my current driver, the one that's up in uh, on your X5000s now, there is no V-SATA device. You take this part out, right? 
this is gone. So every unit you can meet. And if you have, you probably tried to uh, unplug a disk and plug in a new disk and things went all the way. <laughs> That's what, right? Because we're trying to solve every problem with a hammer. It's not the right solution. Yeah. Every, every disk driver has to do this again and again and again. Because the middle layer doesn't exist. Because it doesn't exist. Yeah. So the idea is to try and tease out this middle layer, this virtual layer, which is something very common to them. Not except virtual. Uh, like between right. that and the device layer. Always had. Well, not being on Long on that. We don't have that luxury yet. So the idea is he wanted me to tease out this virtual layer, give it a try. If it works, we're going to try and make it common so that everyone can use it. For now, of course, it's just embedded within the P10.2 SATA device. That's all just one big conglomerate for the user. The idea is to tease that out and make it separate. A uh, monitor library, for example, used to be inside the track disk device. It didn't exist either. So you had file system talks to P1022 station. Nothing in between. Is the disconnect right now when you stick a CD into a CD drive that the SATA driver or the 1022 or the X1000 is still incomplete and not calling Mounter? Or is it with Mounter? No, it is counting Mounter today. But it's not enough. But, so, but is Mounter not complete and doesn't recognize the CD? No, no, it's fine. It's, it's fine. Yeah. I've noticed, like, on the X5000, you can take a CD and put it in there. It doesn't recognize it. But if I use a USB CD drive, stick it in there, it recognizes it's fine. Yes. yes. So where is that? That that broken piece is is because of the uh, missing B data device. That layer. It doesn't know what's happened. It doesn't know what's happened. Which, uh, which I'll show you in the next next one here. Um, so this this is a view of software entities, and then this is a view of all the tasks involved, all the processes. Now, unfortunately, if you're writing a disk driver, you have no processes; you have tasks because it's before DOS. <laughs> so you take you know take one hand and tie it behind your back. Now go. <laughs> You've lost all the luxury of DOS. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so this is kind of trying to show you. There's a bunch of tasks involved, and these are all the tasks involved. Just to read data off your port at the bottom. See, at the bottom is your port. You see the zero. Right. That's that's all you want to do. Is you want to pull data off. Right. Well, that's talking to a unit task which would be a unit processing or other printer. I, yeah. I don't get the process. The yeah, task. yeah, right. <laughs> it's an Ethernet driver, so it has the advantage of being much after DOS. Yes, then you're after DOS. Later. You've got lots of lots of great things. Test the entire OS. Yeah. Do anything you like. Unfortunately, you can't do that with the device so, driver. So, or disk driver. Um, but I do do a unit per port. I find that to be the easiest. Uh, it's not something you generally want to do on a disk driver. You don't want to do context changes. You don't want to do task switching. Because your modern uh, SATA devices, like your uh, flash drives, are so fast that context switches actually start to eat your time. Right. And uh, if that becomes a problem, you become the bottleneck by context switching. So in uh, other OSs like uh, Linux again, there's no context switch all the way from your read function to the device driver and back. No context switch. So it never switch, switches tasks <laughs> to just try to tease that much more performance out. All the performance. So as the rates go up, more of these simplified views 
become a problem. But I, I found it, it was so difficult to work without having a task on each port that, that just not worth the trouble. Because I needed signals, I needed message ports. All these things are taken away from the client. Right? Because we have the guy calling you, he's some application, he's got all his own signals, and you're going to take more? <laughs> you're going to take more? <laughs> You can't wait on anything. You can't, you know, all these restrictions that came in. It was too difficult. So I did put a task per form. Um, just to simplify. It. Make it way easier. Then, then you have this little guy over here in the corner. You're like, well, what, what's that? <laughs> well, you have to, in the uh, in the SATA world, you have to have a dischange task to monitor when somebody swaps the media. Because the interrupt driven media swapping is non standard and doesn't work everywhere. So it's easier to pull. So every second, I think, I go, is it still the disc in there? Is it still the disc in there? Is it still the disc in there? <laughs> every second. Sometimes I might bump it up a little, dial it back a little, depending on how patient the user is, right? Kind of push them, maybe wait two seconds. Yeah. <laughs> Look at Paul, you can push them to three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, like Mac OS. He's like, why is it so slow? <laughs> Get an email. <laughs> oh, 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 dial back. <laughs> <laughs> Someone noticed. Yeah, I, I, I've been playing with numbers. I, I think I tried 1.5 once to see if anyone noticed. No one, no one screamed. <laughs> well, that's because you just kept telling us, oh, this swapping's broken, it's broken, and everybody just went, damn, Stephen, get back to work. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> 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 I've got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I have to invent this little discharge task. And the little discharge task actually is a um, hanging off of that B SATA device. So this little B SATA device, he launches a little disk change task. He owns it. Which is nice. Because in the past, I had the unit owning the disk change task. Pain! Because <laughs> you had this little guy over in the corner always nagging you constantly, right? And not going through the usual channels, right? He's cheating. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was just a conceptual nightmare. Um, in this case, I also showed what happens with CD file system. The CD file system spawns a task per uh, volume, I think it's called. So if you had, say, three different partitions on there, three volumes, and it would have three tasks. Um, NGFS is different. It uses the new port, uh, or the new vector port, and doesn't have its own task. So it avoids a contact switch and kill your performance. So NGFS just goes straight from the application, does its magic, talks directly to my task, my unit task. So bypasses it. So that's what I'm trying to show here. For your, your application, whatever it is, it's just you say read, it goes through NGFS, pops up here. So now there's DOS in between, but I'm not considering it. It's not interesting for this problem. <laughs> there's DOS in there. <laughs> Underneath is really talking to this file system. Wait until Colin finds out. Wait until Colin finds out, yeah. Uh, and then over here, you have, well, who's this guy? Who's this monitor task out of here? Well, every time there's a disk change, monitor task gets involved and goes, okay, like I said, it's going to go scan the media, find out how many volumes are, go ping, 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 create the file system for each one, and then let them run. Launch. Because uh, essentially what mounter task is doing is it's, uh, it's uh, going to the file system, the list of file systems, and saying, OK, uh, I need a, I know, HFS. Is there an HFS guy? Who, who handles him? And you go, <laughs> OK, you, you, you lunch. You go, you go after it, right? And it, it's a fairly good system. It's a little hokey, but it works. It works. And everything's pluggable, which is nice. So you can 
unplug uh, you know one file system for another. We've been doing that for years. Right? If you don't like a file system, replace it with a, another one. Yeah. And you can actually read the same disk, same format. <laughs> oh, so that's kind of a task view. And then my message there was I'm trying to avoid task switching. Uh, I think I put it at the bottom yeah, my context change is bad. The memory copy is also bad. That's another bad thing uh, for Ethernet. Right? You have the same problem. Yeah. Uh, our current system forces you to copy every single packet that comes in there. Nobody else does this. We're special. <laughs> <laughs> I think of line them up first. If you could line them up first. And you can say so you can connect the yep. DMA from the hardware direct directly <laughs> to the application. <laughs> Talk to the application. So he's got the buffer that he wants the data put in. He's got the data. He's got to go through there. He DMAs directly, bang, into his buffer. Done. Yeah, right. <laughs> and that's, that's the goal. That's the goal. That's the goal. Yep. So you DMA directly from whatever the peripheral is, to say to zero, directly to that buffer, no copy. Okay. That's what we're trying to get to. I've been partially successful. <laughs> and with Tony's help, I think we can go even farther. I'm working with Tony, it's NGFS. And you work with Olaf, Rocho, same goal. Get that DMA into the direct into that buffer. One. No more copy. <laughs> if we can avoid it. Now, if you have to copy, at least use a DMA engine to copy. Right. Don't use a CPU. So it's kind of like a two stage thing. So you have your own, uh, the, the same controller still going through the X5000 with the H2. Uh, they have their own DMA to pull the, the pull, pull data off the wires. Oh, actually, yeah. So in, in our, in both of our X5000, X1000, and uh, the only way to pull data off is DMA. There is no other way. Yeah, so you've got that hardware. It's already DMA. Yeah, the hardware is using its own DMA to yeah. move the data off the wire. Onto a buffer. Onto a buffer. Now, that buffer. That needs to be copied again to the OS. And well, that's what I'm trying to avoid. Potentially. Yeah. A couple times. Yeah. 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 So if I get the right buffers from the file system, yeah. the file system says, here, here it is, right? Fill up this thing full of data. Then I can do direct and there's no copy. <laughs> but I have so to get a wire it to right. We'll take it right off of the, the network and place it right on the right on the user buffer. Just go right from the network driver to the signal driver. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we can do that too. Yeah, that's another idea. The crossover from yeah. Ethernet to uh the state in back. Yeah. Yeah. It's connected. Yeah, yeah, they are connected to these CPUs. There's like a, a wire right there, the bus. Which is why I was wondering how the actual low-level reads and writes happen at, with the SATA driver, and then the hardware. I mean, is it grabbing just raw blocks of, of yes. data from the device? Yeah. It doesn't know file systems, it doesn't know anything. No, it's just raw it's blocks. Just, it's just blocks. It's, yeah. a, it's a chain of blocks. Yeah. Yeah. So if you can figure out that structure, there's, there's this place right there. I know exactly what the structure is. <laughs> well, yeah, it's documented what it is. So it's like broke the driver, but <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a chain of buffers, and you just fill it up with the transaction, right? Let it go, comes back. There, uh, yes, of course, it's far more complicated than that because you have native command queuing, which means you can fill up that buffer in any order. <laughs> it can read ahead, it can do all sorts of things, like the drive. There's another layer with native command queuing where the drive can now optimize how it wants to do the transactions right. on the physical medium it's talking to. So it can rearrange them, it can do all sorts of things. So, yeah. You could channel it back through the uh, data path acceleration architecture and have it reorder. Yeah, once it gets back on the bus, once it's in native those buffers, then we can, uh, I don't know if you can DMA those buffers somewhere else. I think it's too
two steps. You, you can't directly link it to a different buffer. Like I couldn't go, hey, put an Ethernet purple. I can't do that. Because it has its own target. It has its own target. Yeah, yeah. But you can use the zero <laughs> DMA engine yes. to make that final. Yeah, so we can do two DMAs. One to my internal buffer and then one another DMA to your buffer. You get close. Yes. Very close. Not quite. Yeah, it forces us to do that. That's the way they designed the state of peripheral. Mm -hmm. You have to use their buffers in their order. In a certain memory locations and such. There's restrictions, alignments. <laughs> so <Certain> format. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Very restrictive, but it does work for a degree. Um, so so yeah, it's this works okay. See with a CD file system you don't really notice the speed at all goes slow. They're like, I don't know, ten thousand times slower than you know, flash or whatever. <laughs> so you don't even notice context switches with that. It's not important. You do when you start to put those fancy uh, flash drives in there, right? You're like, hey, it's not going quite fast as I expected. <laughs> like Mark has. And the other thing I want to point out was this little data uh, unit shuffle that's going on. So, uh, Amy was trying to say, well, each you know, each unit belongs to me. It's okay on the far right there. Right? Yes. But there's we'll this guy in the middle. <laughs> He's got 10 units. And they're all active and they're all talking. And they all map somehow to unit 0 and 1 over on the right side. And then they map somehow to work, work, and photos and videos on the left. So you got, that's the, pur the purpose of this new B SATA device is to keep that mapping and handle the dynamics coming and going of the B SATA units. Because those guys, they, uh, they come into existence and then they, they annihilate all the time. They're coming and going, new one, bet, it's gone. <laughs> You just don't know when they're going to show up. Do you have to some traffic then from the, so you've got all these uh, virtual device units. Yeah. And they're all sending down to either the one, the zero, your one, or the zero is the. Yeah, they're just, they're just placeholders, really. Yeah. They're not doing anything. Like, okay. they don't do any work. See, that's the trick. You kind of get to, to the point here. Um, you don't want to do a contact switch. So this V SATA device doesn't have taps. Okay. Yeah. Well, how does it work? Right? It's faking it. See, but V SATA, the file system is talking to V SATA, thinking it's talking to say P to 5020 SATA that switched to the yeah. It thinks it's talking to it. It's not talking to it. Right? <laughs> so what I do is I get my uh, my command coming in. Oh, you want to do a read? Okay, function call to P5020. Right. It's no longer one of those nice command vectors anymore. It's a direct function call. And I come back, and I, oh, here you go, back using the standard exec uh, way of talking, back to the uh, customer. Okay. So it doesn't know the difference. Yeah. You, you got to be sure to run on the correct context. Is this just a table of pointers that you're managing based on? Uh, basically, basically, it's like a bunch of pointers. Yeah. Just a lookup table. Yeah, yeah, a dynamic lookup table. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I'm working right now. So, getting this, getting this working and readable for other humans. <laughs> <laughs> when, when is this expected to debut as part of the architecture of the system? A couple of weeks. <laughs>
fun. He listened. We're you, gonna you make want, you drink sooner or later. Do you want? Do you want to dance? Is that what you want? <laughs> <laughs> you want to see you dance? <laughs>